her and the uncertainties that I still feel, I will continue to make her food or her formula in bottled water, period. So a lot of this is you becoming proactive, you believing in what it is you see and smell and you're living it and use your common sense and don't be afraid if you're uncomfortable as the water slowly comes on to not drink it. We had some conversations with people today in the school district and they really wish and they hope and their first and foremost concern and they asked us to convey this tonight is the safety of the children and bottled water is probably appropriate for you to send with your children to school until we have more answers. So I'm not gonna stand up here and talk. You know, Bob and I are both just gonna be here and we're gonna answer any questions and concerns you have and ways that you can better safeguard yourself as, as this starts to happen. And we do hope that you will continue as people already are reporting what's happening and we will continue to monitor the situation and come back if need be. So with that, who wants to have a go at the first question? Hi. Hi, sir. <laughs> And that's going to go to Bob because he's a water master and runs these municipalities, so he can answer that. There should have been um, monitoring equipment for the chemicals that come into the intake from the river. They can't monitor for everything. There are thousands, tens of thousands of chemicals that could potentially pollute a drinking water system. And they can't monitor for everything. But they can monitor for change in electrical conductivity. They can monitor for the change in the pH. They can monitor for these things that are very inexpensive to monitor. And if something happens, it will trigger an alarm. And then they can look and they can see. I think as this story unfolds, there's going to have to be a reconciliation with the fact that this chemical leaked for possibly up to 24 hours before you, the community, actually started calling the water company and saying there's an odor in our water. You have to understand, the water has to be pumped from the river. It has to be, chemicals have to be added to that water. It has to go through a coagulation process a settling process, then it has to go through filtration, then they add the fluoride and the chlorine, and then it goes to a, a distribution system. And for that much water to make its way into this system, in the winter, the week after one of the coldest winters you've had in a long time, meaning you're using less water, for that much water to have gotten into the system, there will be an analysis of what happened. I don't have the answers now, but as I've just outlined it, you as consumers have a lot of questions for your, for your water company, how that could have happened. So the answer to your question is, is yes, there is monitoring equipment. The other thing on that same subject is, is no, not only is there monitoring equipment, but the EPA, the federal government, and the State Department of Environmental Protection or Drinking Water Branch here in the state that has primacy in West Virginia, um, you require water utilities to inventory and engage in a program called source water protection. And the source water protection program has to be approved by the state in order for them to continue to maintain primacy over the Safe Drinking Water Act and the federal government. And what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to go upstream, up the river and say, what chemical company's there, and what chemical company's there, and what chemical company's there, and inventory all those chemicals so that they don't get surprised and that they're prepared to deal with these chemicals. And my, my frustration comes out of the fact that we are now approaching the fifth day of this event, and nobody's asking those tough questions. Where is the source water protection program, and why were those chemicals not inventoried? 
The one part per million that the Center for Disease Control has put on this chemical in your drinking water supply is arbitrary. They don't know anything about this chemical. And so they just pull the number, one, and now they're going to spend the next couple of months telling you that one is a very low number. It's a, it's a golf ball in the Super Bowl. You know, that's, that's what one part per million is. However, they feed fluoride in your drinking water system. And the maximum contaminant level for fluoride, 0.9, not one. They regulate chemicals in your drinking water system in PPD, halocytic acids, 60, that's 0 0.06. Trihalomethanes, 80, 0.08. They regulate chemicals in your drinking water system in parts per trillion. So just keep moving the decimal point three places. And that's what we're talking about when we come to drinking water safety. So when they put up a big red map of the distribution area and show slivers of it and say, this water is now safe, please define safe. Because I don't know what safe is, and they don't know what safe is. The other aspect of that, that I've cautioned those that I've had the opportunity to speak with, is you have a chemical that is structured and made and manufactured for a particular use, comes into a drinking water system, and it's disinfected with chlorine. That is an oxidizer, okay? If you read your consumer confidence reports on your drinking water, you will see that they regulate disinfection byproducts. And what disinfection byproducts is when chlorine comes in contact with regular organic, naturally occurring organic material, not man-made organic material, but they have the same chemical reaction. What happens is the chlorine will attach to those molecules and convert them into some thousand plus chemicals. And those are called trihalomethanes or halocytic acids. And go home and Google up. West Virginia American Water Company, look at your consumer confidence report, and those chemicals are regulated in parts per billion, not parts per million, because they are carcinogenic and they are toxic. And they are created when chlorine oxidizes those organics. The same thing is happening to this chemical. And I would venture to say, because I haven't done the science, and neither have they, that that chemical is oxidized into 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 different chemical compounds, many of which are more dangerous than the chemical that was released in the first place. And we just don't have the answer to that. So, yes, ma'am. I think my biggest fear after drinking a glass of my own water is that this is all going to be swept under the rug and, um, you know, the governor is one of his first press conferences to make sure to distance this from coal companies. And we don't know who to trust. And we don't know, um, we're lucky to have some investigative journalists who will keep digging. But who do we ask and how do we keep the pressure on when we feel like we're facing kind of a tide of go along, get along, go along, get along? Did she just say, <coughs> Cole? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we're not gonna let that happen. You're not gonna let that happen. That's why 30,000 of you reached out to Aaron and said, please come to town so that doesn't happen. So it's not get along, go along. We've met with some of your legislators today. Aaron had a great meeting um, with your local senator from, from the community here. Um, and Chris Walters, new senator, great guy. First time I met him, wow. I didn't, I couldn't tell you, you know, what party he was from. He just gives a, a big, huge care for everybody here who wants to do the right thing. This is not gonna get swept under the rug as far as he's concerned.